Good afternoon and welcome to the last webinar Wednesday of 2019. We're excited to have over 230 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday t-shirt for answering this trivia question. What beverage company has been using Santa Claus in its advertising since 1931? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to Ice Imaging Expo, which takes place at the Hilton Scottsdale Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona, from February the 9th to the 11th, which will bring imaging service professionals from across the nation for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in imaging. Registration is now open, and more details can be found at attendice.com. Also, please save the date for our Spring MD Expo, which will be taking place at the Hotel Irvine, California, from April the 20th to the 22nd. More details can be found at mdexposhow.com. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our webinar Wednesday t-shirt, and it is Chris Ball. Congratulations, Chris. Of course, the correct answer is Coca-Cola. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Vizia Technologies. Vizia is a leading provider of technology solutions for healthcare organizations. For more information, visit viziatech.com. Our moderator for today is Dave Weedman, Chief Commercial Officer at Vizia Technologies. Dave, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction and to MD Publishing for hosting this event. To our online audience, welcome to the RTLS and IoT webinar. Today's sponsor and participants are Vizia Technologies and Cooper Lighting Solutions. As Linda mentioned, I'm Dave Weedman, the Chief Commercial Officer for Vizia Technologies and today's moderator. Joining me in the room as speakers today, Andy Hallis, Chief Executive Officer for Vizia Technologies, Arth Joshi, Chief Technology Officer for Cooper Lighting Solutions, and Eric Jerger, Vice President and General Manager for Cooper Lighting Solutions. Today's agenda is divided into three broad topics. We'll start with Parth discussing the advances in location-based IoT, followed by Eric Jurger highlighting the benefits of a smart hospital and concluding with Andy reviewing two of the prominent use cases. At this time, I'll turn it over to Parth. Parth? So good afternoon. Again, this is uh, Parth Joshi from Cooper Lighting Solutions. What I'll spend a few minutes here is talking about some of the advancements in uh, location-based technologies and some of the things that are making it more and more commonplace as we look at the future of both RTLS and location-based services, which we'll cover in detail. So I'm sure everyone's heard of the term IoT or the Internet of Things. And we understand that IoT at a high level is linking the physical world to the digital and the online world. And so taking it one step further is what we call location-based IoT. And we'll talk a little bit about that and why it matters. So at a high level, location-based IoT helps us answer the question of where something is in terms of an individual or a piece of equipment or where, some, where things are, multiple pieces of equipment or multiple people. It also helps answer the question of where am I in a location. So overall, these are important things that are making their way into our lives and being solved by the technology of IoT and things like wearable technologies. And so as we look a little bit further um, at this slide, what this does is talk through the history from the left to the right over the last few decades of where these technologies have gone through. So at the highest level, all the way on the left, things in location-based technology started off at a very high level of being able to give the answer of questions as where is my package or being able to explain that your FedEx package was within a hub somewhere in Memphis. Those technologies adopted from early on to get more advanced to being able to tell you where things are on a map or on a floor plan. So going from telling you what city you're in to telling you where in the city you're in using things like GPS. As we move further and further, we're getting to the point now where those analytics and those type of location 
algorithms are giving you even more advanced um, patterns. So think about technologies that we use in our everyday life. So if you think of uh, Google Maps or Waze, that's a technology for location that's telling you where you're at, where you're going, but also adapting as things like traffic or accidents come in the way. And so this is a kind of pattern that's really coming in there. As we look at the top right and we look out a few years, location-based and um, technologies that are getting more enhanced are not just telling you where you're at on a map or where you, uh, where you can locate something. They're telling you actions or they're telling you advanced analytics of what could happen in the future and doing something with that data. So a good example of that in the future, going from the example of ways where it tells you where to drive your car is the future of the self-driving car where location-based algorithm is telling your car where to go and how to act. So it's uh, all those technologies working together. And what's happened in the last few years is uh, automation and things like advanced sensors, algorithms, and new software architectures are really bringing those things together. So what I wanna do on the next slide now is cover kind of the present case and where we're going in the very short future. So we talked a little bit on the last slide about the direction of our location-based IoT technologies in the world. And where we're seeing them go right now is to solve higher value problems and come up with new solutions that are expanding very quickly to come into multiple segments for people. And the reason why location-based technologies and other things like that are making their way more into the real world is through the um, increase of cellular phones or smartphones, wearable devices, and other IoT devices that are making their way into consumer markets at a much cheaper cost point. So with the exponential growth of these type of IoT devices, with the growth of uh, cheaper computing devices, easier access for people to get uh, smartphones and wearables, and newer advanced uh, software, these advances in uh, location-based IoT are moving on the right side of the pyramid from the bottom to the top. So we're going from the point of just collecting uh, basic data and information, what you would consider the what and the where, to being able to solve more advanced outputs and giving us more features like solving the how using the algorithms and set some of that machine learning. So not only are you locating where a piece of equipment might be in a in a big building or in a hospital, but it's also telling you now furthermore where it might be required next or how many of those pieces of equipment you need to really uh, suffice your organization. It also helps solve problems and tells you uh, solutions to has somebody visited um, a hand hygiene station before they've entered into a patient room. So more and more will get further value out of this type of data. So as we dig a little bit deeper uh, from the history of where we're uh, at and where we're going, one of the big areas to focus is um, the technology behind location-based services. And while it seems like a new term, it's important to know that the technologies behind location-based services have been around for uh, years and even decades. And they've uh, mostly started or focused on the outdoor space due to their um, accuracy or their size or their cost. And what we're seeing now um, is they're making their way indoors. So there's many examples that everyone has heard of that are shown here on the right side of the screen, such as radar, GPS, or RFID. Those technologies have been with us for years and decades, and those have been used to track location in the outdoor settings. What's happening now with the breakthrough in new protocols, in new RF technologies, phones, wearables, and the move to indoor solution is happening much quicker and is being aided by new things like Bluetooth, low energy, BLE, Wi-Fi, VLC, and other technologies that are shown in the indoor bucket there on the, on the left. So we're seeing a good trend over the last couple of years that's increasing every year of taking location services from the outside to the inside now. And with the next slide, I'll cover kind of a little bit more detail on what's happening uh, indoors. The location-based services, you know, finding its way indoors now. As we mentioned, with the focus on um, indoors, we see two major uses or applications of these 
technologies of location-based services. The first, which is more the focus of today's talk later on, is real-time location systems, which is known as RTLS. This is, a, this is a primary focus, and we'll dive a little bit deeper, but this is locating people and assets inside a, inside a building. And the second is wayfinding, which, we'll, uh, which we won't dive too deep into today. So as we look at it a little bit uh, further on RTLS, or real-time location systems, at the highest level, what RTLS is, is being able to locate a person or people, assets or other objects indoors on a floor plan, or give a central user, like a hospital administrator, a view or inventory of multiple people, assets, or equipment of a whole building or a whole campus of buildings. And so where this gets much more powerful than a GPS is instead of telling you one, um, one asset or one car and where you're headed, this can tell you hundreds or thousands of different things that are going on in your building and where all of those things or people are located at any given time. Beyond the where of the people or the assets, RTLS or real-time location services will also help using advanced analytics to help answer the how and the what to expect once you know all those locations of those hundreds of assets, people, or devices. And it'll help us to solve further problems using those data, using uh, solving problems like space utilization or understanding how much equipment you really need in a hospital or a medical facility. And so that at a high level is kind of the technology and what uh, real-time location systems is. And for my last slide before we move um, to the next section, it's kind of, you know, what is the use cases of uh, location-based services and RTLS as it combines with uh, lighting systems. And to help uh, segue into the next section, what's very interesting to understand is for most facilities, there's already a lighting system or a connected lighting system that is going in place. Using that common infrastructure to solve problems like RTLS is something we, f we believe has multiple customer impacts and benefits across all different segments. And that's one of the main reasons we're focusing there. There's huge advantages between the lighting infrastructure and RTLS and using a common um, infrastructure there. The first being the density of the luminaires. We have hundreds of luminaires or lighting per, fic uh, per floor. That helps us increase our accuracy. The cost of the technology reduces as people are putting in lighting systems anyways in their floors. The battery maintenance piece is not required because they're powered by the fixtures. And then the sensors blend into the background because they become very small and easy to use using technologies like Bluetooth, low energy. This same infrastructure of lighting will help solve other problems such as motion, temperature, humidity, and uh, air quality because we have it in the ceiling and we've deployed hundreds of them across, uh, across different buildings. And the last thing to kind of end this slide is things, um, the reason why it's a perfect time and has been for uh, getting into this uh, arena to solve this problem of location-based IoT along with connected lighting is there's very common technologies that have made their way into both of these uh, solutions, starting with uh, Bluetooth low energy and advanced wireless to new sensors that have come out, edge computing, enterprise lighting systems that can do RTLS, floor plans, mobile applications, and wearables that are getting cheaper by, by the year. And so when all these things come together, it makes for a perfect um, high-tech application to solve customer problems related to lighting-based IoT using lighting as an infrastructure. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Dave. Art, thank you so much for your comments. Eric Jurger will now highlight Cooper's smart lighting platform. Great. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Parth. Okay, let's jump into how we put this technology in use in a hospital to solve real customer problems, again, through Cooper's smart spaces IoT platform called Trellix. To start, what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time on the numerous problems that uh, healthcare professionals face today. The first one, of course, around poor hand hygiene and infections caused by poor, poor hand hygiene. 
in an average year, one in 20 patients will acquire an, an infection that they didn't have when they arrived at the hospital, which means that almost 2 million patients have to be treated. And unfortunately, close to 100,000 of those patients will die from that infection. And the number one cause is doctors and nurses not washing or sanitizing their hands before treating the patient. Certainly a problem that is top on the list of many healthcare professionals. Aside from that, hand, aside from hand hygiene, patient workflow is another huge opportunity for hospitals as emergency room overcrowding means that 2% of patients are left without treatment, which can equate to up to $2 million loss for the hospital a year. Others are, of course, decreasing patient wait times during peak hours, increasing the amount of patient staff interaction, and of course, ensuring that patients are safe while they are staying in a hospital. Others are around decreasing the operational costs of monitoring and maintaining equipment. And one that's near and dear to the CE staff revol revolves around proactive maintenance for hospital equipment and the loss of productivity in searching for that equipment. And so in general, the C-suite focuses on making the facility more operationally efficient and providing a better experience for the patient. But before you can work to solve these problems, you need data and actionable insights. Data on where a piece of equipment is, how long it's been there, data on how long doctors spend with patients, and data on the time it takes to see a doctor. So the approach to a smart hospital begins with laying the infrastructure to collect this data. And the way we approach this is through the lighting infrastructure, as Parth mentioned. And, and why is that? The bottom line is lighting is everywhere, it's pervasive, it's evenly spaced, and it's constantly powered. And LED and lighting controls save up to 70% energy over traditional fluorescent lighting with traditional controls and provide a very quick ROI. Your entire RTLS can be funded through energy savings with an ROI generally under two years. And once in place, your facility is effectively future-proofed and the sensor network can be used for a variety of applications and use cases as shown in the granular data in the middle column. And the data can help solve some of your most complex problems as we discussed earlier. You can use the sensor network to activate RTLS, optimize your space, of course, control your lights, and optimize the amount of energy you save. And from that, you build a smart building, and that data from the sensor can be used to make very impactful changes. Again, improving patient care, optimizing workflow, improving staff efficiency. The opportunities are, are truly endless in a smart hospital. In order to do that, we lay the foundation and it begins with a sensor a little bit larger than a dime and it's integrated into every LED fixture on a hospital campus. And that could be indoor, patient rooms, outdoor, parking garage. And if you've already upgraded LED, that's okay as well. We can power that sensor off a nearby fixture. And this sensor collects a wide variety of data that be, can, can become very useful, position data. By pairing this sensor with a tag, either on a person or a piece of equipment, the system can tell you the location by room or by area. Motion, motion, and, and this data allow, uh, can be collected around the uses of spaces, conference rooms, to help understand the utilization of the space, and perhaps even how to heat and cool it appropriately based on the level of occupancy in the space. In atriums or areas with windows, light sensing can become very important. We can actually dim the lights when the sun comes into the space for increased energy savings or measure light levels uh, around patient wellness. And lastly, power. Every fixture and every sensor is collecting real metered power data to prove that energy savings that I discussed earlier and can go even further in fault detection capabilities. So the bottom line is that this sensor collects a wide variety of data and we make this data available to our partners such as Vizia to crunch these numbers, perform the analytics 
and tell you exactly where to focus for optimum operational efficiency. And we deploy this system through the same type of infrastructure used for basic lighting and lighting control. This is a, an overview of Trellix. And very simply, you can see the number of devices and where those are located, but bottom line from a, a keypad to the sensor that I mentioned earlier, uh, stretching from indoor spaces into outdoor and pathway and into parking garages, the infrastructure literally covers every square foot of your facility. In the architecture, it's, it's four simple steps to collect data, connect data, exchange data, and provide data insight, starting left to right. Tags are placed on patients, staff, equipment, and location data is generated through an on-premise server called the Trellix Core. Several applications are available to manage basic light levels, admin rights, et cetera. And the core is an on-premise server, which means simpler deployment for the IT department. In addition, the system is very scalable. It can start with a floor, a wing, and then expand as you add on to the core starting with just a few sensors and building up to over 50,000 sensors and scales up to 5 million square feet. And as I mentioned, the use cases are endless and Cooper's partnered with a market leading solutions integrator. And together we can help solve your most complex problems by deploying a system that can be funded with the energy savings gain through LED and controls. Eric, thanks so much for the comments. Andy Hallis will now steer the final segment while reviewing two of the prominent use cases. Andy? Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Parth and Eric. Um, Vizia has been working in the healthcare industry 100% focused for over 14 years, trying to solve with our hospital and clinic partners the most aggressive challenges they have to workflow. How we solve those problems is we put in a, a sensor system um, and we help the hospital select the right kind of system and have been for all 14 years when we started back in the day with just passive RFID, now to these sophisticated systems that Parth alluded to earlier. Um, so we help evaluate and select them and then we deploy them. We deploy them so that we can get good, accurate data for the use cases that we work on. Um, then we install software, our own proprietary software, and the magic is in the rules and alerts and automated communications that our software triggers based on the location data that we get from that infrastructure. Um, so this is critical piece of the, the puzzle, but the most important piece really lies in process redesign, changing how people operate based on the data that we harvest. Um, it's a critical piece of the puzzle that, um, that oftentimes gets left out. So as I mentioned earlier, we put in sensor systems um, and that includes sensor systems for refrigerators and freezers and room conditions and so forth. Um, and then uh, we also uh, track equipment and help improve how equipment, movable medical equipment in particular, is distributed throughout the hospital. And then as well, now on the human side of things, how do patients flow through the uh, medical process, um, the healthcare process? And so these are all the areas that we're focusing on and that we have specific modules to help improve uh, based on the location data that we get. So um, as Dave had mentioned, I'm going to just cover a couple of key, key uh, applications um, or use cases. Um, first is asset management. And in, in the healthcare world, and in particular in hospitals, um, what we mean by asset management is really movable medical equipment distribution. Um, typically, hospitals have somewhere between five to ten million dollars worth of movable medical equipment, and they are 
almost always utilized in an inefficient manner um, to a point where their fleets are typically being utilized at 40 to 50 percent as we do assessments at the early stage of, of um, a, an, an engagement with someone, we will assess what their utilization rates are, and it's rare that they're above 50%. Um, the root cause of that typically is the process that they have um, and the visibility that they have to where their assets are, where this movable medical equipment is. Um, in addition, hospitals struggle with loss, um, sometimes theft, um, and a good a five to seven percent of their assets um, go missing. Um, sometimes that's uh, not only loss or theft, but innocent, um, uh, you know, patients, family members thinking that equipment should leave with their patient um, because they spent so much time in the hospital. Um, and then further, what happens when you don't have visibility to your movable medical equipment and the movements that they have and the interactions they have with patients is you wind up renting equipment for spike periods and wind up spending a great deal of uh, money on rentals, especially if your fleet size isn't right. So there's a variety of costs and inefficiencies that are the ability to, to have location-based data that's accurate we can solve through process improvement and, um, and analytics. The other area that I was asked to speak about is um, patient workflow. Um, bottom line is that almost all of us have experienced wait times in whether it's just at a doctor's office or certainly at clinics, surgery centers, and of course in hospital ED waiting rooms. Um, all of these things can be improved upon with the use of these location-based sensor systems and software that takes that location information and communicates auto automatically to the next people in line. The easiest example I can give you is in emergency departments of hospitals. When a patient arrives, they get badged as they get, then they get uh, put into the queue to see a triage nurse. The triage nurse then eventually um, will assign a room to that patient. Once that patient, and of course we're time stamping each of these steps. So we know how long each patient is waiting. We know how long they spend with the triage nurse. We then know once that patient is assigned to a room through an integration that our software will have with the uh, EHR system, we know then to send an automated communication to the nurse that's assigned to that room, that the patient is on their way, they're on deck, be at the room in five minutes or whatever the metric is that, that um, we work with our uh, clients to set up. Then once the nurse and the patient is inside of the room, that means that that visit has started and that patient visit then triggers a communication to the doc assigned to that patient, that they're on deck 10 minutes and so forth. So you can see that just through communications and awareness, you can improve how the workflow gets done and all the data that's being captured gives you all the analytics to be able to go back, analyze bottlenecks, and then improve the flow of patients. Just as examples as you see on the screen, just in emergency departments, there are millions of dollars available by eliminating things like ED diversion. Diversion, as many of you probably know, is when a hospital basically tells ambulances not to come to the hospital because they're full. They can't take any more patients. That is about a $19 billion issue and we're roughly $3.2 million per hospital just by eliminating diversions. You eliminate diversions by being able to move more patients through the healthcare process of that ED. And we can increase uh, capacity for, for EDs 
20, 30% and eliminate diversions. Um, in addition, patients tend to leave hospitals before being treated. And that happens because they're waiting too long. And usually the people that leave are the ones that are the best payers because they have options. So millions of dollars are tied up and uh, this can all be solved or improved upon greatly and save millions of dollars through location-based infrastructure and great communications built in through uh, software platforms like ours. So a, a quick bit about indoor positioning systems and a little bit of the evolution. And the evolution that we started with passive RFID systems 14 years ago, which is that was about the only kind of local indoor location-based um, systems available. And then that migrated into Wi-Fi-based systems and now independent BLE systems. And the challenge with all of these RF-only based systems is that in order to get accuracy, in order to really do workflow improvement, you need to have a lot of sensors and it becomes very expensive either due to wiring or batteries or the cost of the devices themselves um, to do this with these kinds of technologies, including BLE, if it's not part of an infrastructure. You have to put in a lot of sensors and, uh, and, and if it's not already a uh, part of the electrical system, well, you're gonna spend a lot of money on batteries and, and maintenance time. So we're very excited about our partnership with Trellix because as you can see, and as Parth had outlined earlier, the Trellix uh, infrastructure is ubiquitous through an, an, or, an organization because it's built into the lighting and can be just supplemented with a few additional sensors as necessary, but it's all powered by the lighting system itself. So the, the combination of ubiquitous sensors um, and no maintenance um, is an exciting thing for the industry that's not been there before in this way. Um, because accuracy, as you can imagine, trying to do patient-related workflow, you need to know exactly where they are, that they're in this room, not the room next to them, or not in the hallway. They are in that room because that triggers a, an alert and a communication that's essential to building a better process. So Dave, I'll turn it back to you. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank Parth, Eric, and Andy for your comments and insights today. We have started receiving questions, and so I will um, start reading and assigning them to one of today's speakers. Parth, I'd like to direct the first question towards you. Regarding longevity, does the software work without an internet connection so that in five to 10 years, that as long as the hardware is installed, the system still works as network protocols advance? In other words, is it backward compatible? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I would start off with first is the way we approach lighting in general and then connected lighting is to develop systems that are robust and that will last for multiple years. And, and that's how our lighting gets installed. It has to work for you know, over 10 years in many cases. So with this same solution in terms of location-based and RTLS software, we've developed it in such a way that it could work both um, on-premise using local hardware that will last for many years and protocols that will be around for a while or in the future connecting through the cloud and doing it that way. So in short, the answer is yes, it's been developed and architected to last for multiple years, just like our uh, hardware in our lighting fixtures. Bar, thank you. The next question is directed towards Eric. Eric, how many RTLS sensors can be connected to an LED fixture? Yeah, great, great question, Dave. So you know, typically the way we approach 
this solution is first by understanding the application and the use case and understanding from a customer standpoint, are they interested in room-based accuracy or room-level accuracy or zone-level accuracy? And if it's room-level accuracy, we'll want up to three sensors in a given room, and that could be deployed either through three light fixtures in a room with one sensor per fixture, or those sensors could be powered from a single power module connected to a light fixture. If it's zone level, then again, we could either do it one per fixture uh, or perhaps one in a given room. So I'd like to sit down with the customer first to really understand the problems they're trying to solve, the use cases, and then we'll, we'll architect the system to meet their, their needs. Thank you, Eric. The next question I direct towards Andy. Andy, beyond location, when can we know definitively that the device is being used? For example, is the fusion pump actually infusing a patient? Did the staff member actually use the hand cleansing solution or was just near it? Andy? Sure, that's a great question. The first part of that question is about equipment and the infusion pumps. And it's already happening, and it's, it's, a, it's an integration that has to happen with the infusion pump companies. Um, and, um, and you see some of those examples already starting to, to come to the market. Um, so that solution is going to, to be in place, um, uh, I think, very pervasively within the next few years. It's already in, in the case of, of one manufacturer. Um, the second one, um, similar similar uh, question, is um, with soap dispensers, um, and and that also has been solved um, for the most part already, um, because many of the soap dispenser companies already have uh, sensing technologies that uh, determine that they've injected soap. It's not just about the person being close to something. They that device actually injected soap. So I think in both cases, um, solutions have already hit the market and are, are going to continue happening uh, and get better. Great. Thank you, Andy. Next question is uh, directed at Parth. Uh, Parth, do you use motion sensors? Yeah, so back to the kind of the answer Eric said and sitting down with customers to use their applications. In short, one of our use cases could utilize motion sensors for further accuracy depending on the use case. So they could be required or could not depending on the accuracy required and the specific application that the customer is trying to target. Great, Parth, I appreciate it. Uh, Next question is directed at Eric. Eric, can you retrofit lighting solutions? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Only about 5% of healthcare facilities have actually upgraded to LED, and so our focus is to make that upgrade or conversion from traditional fluorescent to LED very, very simple and affordable for a hospital. We do that through an LED retrofit kit with the integrated sensor embedded in the fixture itself, and that can be accessed and retrofitted from below the ceiling. So you actually don't need to access the ceiling or above the ceiling plenum to do that. And that retrofit process takes about five minutes per fixture to retrofit to LED with that integrated sensor. Great. Thanks, Eric. Next question is for Andy. Andy, can you get bed level accuracy, such as ED bay with multiple beds without sensor bleeding to the next bed? Um, yes, um, it, we, we are actually achieving that already. Um, and uh, it depends on the system and it depends on um, you know, how close the bed is and what the workflow is around that bed in order to make that uh, level of accuracy meaningful. Because it's not just about the bed, it's about the activities around the bed. So, uh, but yes, it's, it's already achievable. Okay. 
And um, I'm going to aim this question, Andy, back at you. I'm doubling up on you. You may have to help me interpret uh, this one. Uh, the, the question is posed, is this RTLS able to be integrated in existing medical device or de devices to be visible and monitored? Um, yeah, so I think the, the questioner is asking about whether this system, the Trellix platform, can be integrated into another hardware, like, like an infusion pump, to make it visible in the system and then also um, uh, know whether it's running or not. And I, I think the short answer, I should turn it over really to Parth, uh, but I believe that this, the answer is that that's, that's a, just, we have to spend time, the, the, the Parth and his team have to spend time with the manufacturer to build that capability, but the sensor capabilities are, are there. Yeah, the, the thing I'd add on to this is using the open technologies that we've used and the protocols that we use, such as Bluetooth, low energy, BLE, there's many other applications that we can do in the future. And so those are things that we'll look at kind of in the in the next phases. Okay. Thank you, Parth. I appreciate it. The next question, I'll throw it up like a like a lob for Eric or Andy. Um, sounds like Andy may want to grab this one. So regarding HIPAA and data security. What steps has your software taken to ensure unique IDs can be de-anonymized given any data breach and historical data? Sure. Um, well, first of all, um, that's a great question. It's one of great concern to the whole healthcare industry. Data security is very important. Um, for us, it's a very straightforward um, thing because all of the data that we receive whether it's a, a patient tag number or uh, it's all digitized and also all secured uh, encrypted and then transferred to our HIPAA secured data center and a HIPAA compliant data center so um, all we really get there is is encrypted data and uh, that's how we uh, ensure that that it's um, that it's not a, a risk. Um, in addition to that, we really aren't capturing any um, healthcare-related information here. We're, we're transferring digits and numbers, um, and and at most um, basic location information. Um, so it's um, we we uh, we're quite secure with our data. Great, thank you, Andy. Next question um, is once again uh, for Andy, and this is a broad question. What are you hearing from healthcare professionals in the market? Well, that's a broad question. I mean, we, we, are, we are hearing um, it, it, what's happening in healthcare more than anything is consolidation. Um, you know, Health systems are buying other hospitals. Uh, health systems are merging with each other. And so what everyone is looking for is how to improve operations. It's, it's, healthcare has always been very good from a technology perspective at, um, at um, diagnosis, using technology for diagnosis and really health-related technology. What we're seeing now and what the, the industry leadership is, is clamoring for is how to improve uh, their operational efficiencies and effectiveness because they've already drained as much cost out of their systems as, as they can. Um, reimbursement rates from insurance companies are declining, so everyone's under the squeeze. So efficiency and operational efficiency is what people are clamoring for. And it, it's the right time now for these kinds of technologies as a result of that. Great, thank you, Andy. Next question is for Eric. Eric, what problems does a lighting-based infrastructure eliminate compared to other RTLS solutions? Yeah, thanks, Dave. 
for a lighting based infrastructure, it's really all about solving the problem of total cost of ownership. And if the RTLS is part of the lighting solution, you can generally reduce your total cost of ownership by up to 50%. Most other systems use a battery operated uh, sensor beacon. So from a maintenance standpoint, there's no need to maintain thousands of batteries. Uh, because it's constantly powered by the light fixture, uh, that is effectively maintenance free. Uh, further, it, it's one company to provide both the lighting, the controls, and the RTLS, and it's one number to call for both. Uh, of course, that means one less system to maintain. Fantastic. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. Next question is for Andy. Andy, um, time monitoring. Patient check-in is great, but how does the doctor follow the time to be in the room? Well, um, that's the timestamp of the entry point into that room and the exit point. And it's a, it's a, it's a calculation, um, if, if I'm understanding the question right. I think you are. Thank you. I appreciate it. Parth, um, one, uh, this just came in directed at you. What is the emerging technology in real-time location systems and why? So there's a couple of uh, core advanced technologies that are emerging or have been emerging that have made their way into making RTLS possible. The first being Bluetooth low energy, second being advanced sensing, uh, mobile applications, and then lastly, uh, wearable devices. All those things uh, connected to other technologies that have been prevalent like IoT, um, uh, gateways, and other sort of things that are making their way into lighting have helped solve this problem for the indoor space. Great. Thank you, uh, Parth. And one last question for Andy. Andy, what's the best way to get started with a real-time location system? That's a great question. I think it's a it's a question that a lot of healthcare organizations um, wrestle with. Um, the first most important thing is, I think, selecting the use case or use cases that are that will uh, eliminate the most pain for an organization. Um, but I also would recommend that anybody that's going through that process also looks ahead because um, you can you can solve simple use cases or single use cases with a lot of different technologies. What's really important is to look ahead and have a vision for, well, okay, what other things can I solve once I have this infrastructure? Um, and as you saw in Eric's presentation, there are many different use cases that will help improve operational efficiency. And so our suggestion is pick the most important ones and prioritize them, but look across your enterprise, whether it's a hospital or a health system, and then prioritize all the use cases and then, then select your platform because it's ideal if you can accomplish all of them with one platform rather than many different platforms. So that, that's how I would suggest it. Fantastic, Andy. So, well, I'm going to give everybody uh, five minutes back to their day. Look, I'd like to thank MD Publishing for hosting. I'd like to thank our speakers, Parth, Eric, and Andy today. And Linda, at this point, we will turn it back over to you. Thank you and happy holidays. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, thank you all for a, a great and really informative webinar. Um, and thank you again to today's sponsor, Visa Technologies. Uh, just a reminder that the post-webinar survey and certificate process is now automated. So the survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you'll receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately, and one lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the survey. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. And for more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. Um, I'd just like
like to say thank you for your continuous support to Webinar Wednesday and I'd like to wish you a happy Christmas from everybody here at Tech Nation and MD Publishing. Thank you all once again and enjoy the rest of your day.